Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Lecture Series. Sit back, get comfortable, and let's go see what Marty has for us today. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome once more to another program of the Peninsula Seniors. We're very happy and honored to have uh, another repeat performance by Andy Lorenzen, who uh, is going to look at an historical perspective of a part of World War II, the uh, campaign in the Philippines. After General MacArthur made his um, return, uh, one of the first things that he did was to organize three actions to liberate prisoner of war camps, three of them, that the Japanese had maintained, both for U.S. Ser servicemen as well as civilians. And uh, Andy Lorenzen will tell us about some of those three raids to a camp uh, south of Manila, north of Manila, and in Manila itself. And he'll also share the historical significance of those events as well as the personal impact on his life. So please join me in welcoming Andy Lorenzo. Well, thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to meet with the Peninsula seniors. Uh, at least I don't have to explain to you what World War II is. <laughs> uh, I was here just a little over two years ago to talk about my personal experience as a prisoner of war of the Japanese in uh, Santa Tomas in Manila. And since then, uh, a couple of things have happened. First of all, my book, A Lovely Little War, was published, which uh, describes my personal experience in the camp. And second of all, I've become a commander of the civilian POW organization that serves uh, civilian POWs uh, from East Asia who uh, live all over the United States. In January of this year, our organization uh, had its 65th reunion of the liberation. And we had a series of panel discussions from people in each of the camps that were liberated in February of 1945. The panelists described what they were doing and what they saw when the American troops rolled into their camp and liberated them. And it was uh, fascinating to hear these stories since all of us had a different perspective. We were in a different place and we saw a different thing. But I had the privilege of introducing the panels and because the panelists were discussing only that moment in time when the tanks or the infantry came charging through the gates, uh, I thought it would be a good idea to talk about how the, the Americans got to their camp because it was a long and involved process. And uh, it was tremendously beneficial to them but had a tremendous historical pers uh, importance also to the way the military operated. The, uh, there were three great raids. Five years ago, a movie came out called The Great Raid. It was about the Cabanatuan uh, liberation by the 6th Ranger Battalion. The uh, movie was roughly based on the story by Hampton Sides called The Ghost Soldiers. I met Hampton in Manila five years ago when he was there for the premiere of the movie. And I asked him, are you planning to write a book about the other great raids that occurred after the Cabanatuan raid? And he looked at me quizzically and said, what do you mean? And I pointed out to him that the Cabanatuan raid was the first of three great raids, and the following two raids had much more military significance than the one he had written about, though they were all exciting and very daring. The three raids that all happened within about a three-week period resulted in the liberation of four POW camps and 8,000 military and civilian prisoners. But how did they come to pass? Well, it all starts 
back in uh, 1944 when General Marshall started the planning for the invasion of Japan. In his planning, he had decided that the road to Japan would be through Taiwan, or at that time, Formosa. And uh, that would be the jumping off point for the uh, invasion of the home islands. When MacArthur heard about that, he traveled back to Washington to try to change the plan. And in a one hour meeting that he had with General Marshall and uh, President Roosevelt, he was able to change the course of history. He showed them that Formosa was really off the coast, surrounded by Japanese. The Japanese not only occupied the China coast, but at, in early 44, they were pushing back the Chinese army to recapture airfields that the uh, Air Corps had been using to bomb the home islands. And he said the reliance on Chiang Kai-shek to change what he was doing and to become aggressive and to push the Japanese out of East China uh, would be almost impossible. Chiang Kai-shek had 200 divisions that the U.S. had equipped and trained, but 100 of those divisions were being used to contain the communist army. And uh, Chiang Kai-shek was preserving all of his armaments for the war that would take place after the end of World War II. The second thing, point that uh, MacArthur made was that the Philippines were squarely in the path between Japan and where Japan's strategic materials were coming from, oil, rubber, uh, rice. They all had to pass by or through the Philippines to get to Japan. At the end of that meeting, President Roosevelt agreed the path to Japan would be through the Philippines. Then in October of 1944, MacArthur followed up with the invasion of Leyte. Uh, once Leyte was essentially pacified, he moved on to other islands, but his most important invasion was of Luzon. January 9th of 1945, the Sixth Army landed at Lingayen Gulf in what at that time was the largest invasion uh, that had ever occurred for, with the American forces. Standing in his way, was the Japanese, where General Yamashita had accumulated a quarter of a million Japanese troops to oppose the invasion on Luzon. He had them grouped in three places. In the north, in the mountains, uh, just below Clark Field, and in the south, a part of the island. MacArthur's strategy was to ignore these troops up in the north. He put a blocking force in that was essentially to stop the Japanese from coming to the aid of the other groups as he moved south. MacArthur wanted to move as rapidly as possible into Manila. He had two reasons. One was to return as a conquering hero to the city that he had so ignominiously left in late 1941. And the second was to free POWs. The reason for the second uh, objective was that military intelligence had intercepted a message from the Japanese in Tokyo to local commanders which ordered them to kill all POWs before they could be liberated. So he wanted to move uh, and try to stop that slaughter. He moved straight down the Central Valley uh, with his army uh, until approximately the end of January when his lead force, the 37th Infantry, banged into the uh, Japanese Kembu group just short of Clark Field. The advance came to a shuddering halt and things became static. At that time, a group of guerrillas 
went to his uh, G2 uh, general and proposed that they could assist in a uh, operation to free the prisoners at Cabanatuan. There were 516 POW, military POWs who had survived from uh, Bataan and Corregidor. That was all that was left of several thousands of Americans who had been in Cabanatuan, but who had been shipped to slave labor camps in Japan, Korea, and Manchuria. The ones left were too weak to be of any value as slave laborers. MacArthur approved the plan to go ahead with a raid to free, free the prisoners. Uh, three days before the raid was, two days before the raid was to take place, a group of 12 Alamo scouts who were attached to the 6th Ranger Battalion uh, penetrated through the Japanese lines and their mission was to do reconnaissance and to coordinate with the Filipino guerrillas. The next evening, 122 rangers also penetrated the line and um, overnight hiked 30 miles to join up with the guerrillas near Platero, which was about three miles from the Cabanatuan camp. There they coordinated with the uh, guerrillas and the Alamo scouts provided information about the, uh, the situation. They discovered that there were 73 guards in Cabanatuan, which is located right there. Uh, but there was also 150 Japanese infantrymen who were resting up from the battle in the camp. Additionally, there was a division of Japanese troops that was on the move in the highways over here. And the guerrillas advised that the attack not take place on the evening that it had been planned for and at least give time for the uh, division to move out of uh, the area where they could come to the rescue of the garrison at Cabanatuan. The raid was delayed one day, and the next evening, the 30th of January, uh, the troops moved into position uh, shortly before sunset. The guerrillas pointed out that there were 5,000 Japanese located at Cabanatuan City, which was five miles from the camp, but they were more concerned about 1,000 uh, Japanese located at Kabu, across Kabu Creek from the camp, and that was only about a mile, a mile and a half. They were concerned about these troops because when the action started at Cabanatuan, they would be able to hear it and they would respond. They'd be coming like ants coming out of a hive, uh, swarming towards uh, the camp to save them. So the guerrillas were assigned the job of setting up roadblocks, one to stop the Cabanatuan troops from coming to the rescue of the camp, and most important, one to um, across Kabu Creek from the troops that were in Kabu. They placed 600 guerrillas this roadblock and uh, about 200 at this roadblock, hoping that time would delay the, the Japanese response from, from that area. Just prior to sunset, uh, a platoon of rangers moved around to the back of the camp using creeks and drainage ditches to approach the back of the camp. The main force was going to attack the front of the, the uh, camp across the road. And this, most of this area that you see in here uh, was uh, vegetated with tall grass. It was like 12 feet high and provided wonderful cover, which is why they had been able to infiltrate and get as far as they could without Japanese detection. But the last mile to the camp was mown clean. There was no cover whatsoever. So the uh, rangers had to crawl one mile to advance the tank to the um, camp to where they could start the attack. They needed to distract the, the uh, guards, so 
the Army Air Corps had provided a P-61 Black Widow aircraft, that's a twin boom aircraft, and just before sunset, it flew over the camp and started to jink around like it was, uh, it had been damaged or was uh, having mechanical trouble. And the guards all focused their attention on that aircraft. And the rangers crept across the field and took up positions just as it got dark. At 8.45 in the evening, the unit behind the uh, camp opened fire, which was to signal the start of the attack. They opened fire on the uh, Japanese who, uh, infantrymen who were in the rest position. And the rangers, the, the other rangers, rushed the gate, got through the gate very quickly. And uh, in 20 or 30 minutes, they had essentially killed all of the Japanese guards and the infantrymen who were in there. Meanwhile, the guerrillas here were getting into a fierce action as the uh, Japanese at Kabu sent three tanks uh, towards them. They, had, they blew the bridge but on Kabu Creek and stopped the tanks and other vehicles. And then with um, bazookas, they wound up knocking out three tanks. Uh, but the fighting was fierce, and the uh, rangers knew they had to get the prisoners out of the camp as quickly as possible and into cover. The prisoners were not really eager to leave. They had souvenirs, or they had little food packages, or uh, maybe clothes, maybe a pair of shoes with no sole that they weren't willing to leave. And so they were scrambling around trying to pull their uh, belongings together while the rangers were trying to herd them out of the tank, uh, out of the camp. But they finally got them going. They were very debilitated. They, they uh, could hardly walk. They had to go two miles at where the uh, guerrillas had set up uh, caribou carts. Caribou is like a water buffalo. And uh, they got to the uh, carts, they loaded them in, and they could now start moving out more rapidly. The um, caribous would travel at two miles an hour, and they had more than 30 miles to travel to uh, get back into the American lines. The uh, Japanese in the, I mean, the guerrillas that were preventing the Japanese from coming from Kibanatuan uh, City were released from their roadblock and they provided a flank guard. The guerrillas who were fighting the uh, Japanese at Kabu continued to fight until after 2.30 in the morning when the Japanese were finally exhausted and they figured they'd killed 700 of them. Uh, and they then released and they provided a rear guard. The train of caribou carts uh, traveled all night, and then into the next day. They got some air cover the next day, uh, but they kept fairly well concealed, and they finally uh, reached a road not too far from the American lines where a patrol challenged them. Uh, American patrol challenged them, and they were then brought into the American lines at uh, just about dusk on the 31st of January. Uh, immediately put into hospitals and uh, uh, treated. This was an extremely successful attack. Uh, the ca total casualties on the part of the Americans was two rangers killed, uh, two or three were wounded. Uh, there were perhaps a couple of dozen casualties for the guerrillas who were fighting a much more uh, concerted effort by the Japanese, but they calculated that they had killed 700 Japanese, which is a tremendous uh, disparity between casualties of the two forces. That raid and the significance of the Cabanatuan camp was more than that raid. It was 
primarily because it was the main camp that so many thousands of uh, American POWs had been held. Today, uh, there, this is the American Memorial by the American uh, Memorial Commission that handles our battlefield uh, uh, cemeteries and uh, memorials. And this is the memorial at the Cabana Tomp One with a couple of uh, ex-prisoners who had survived that camp. These two gentlemen had been sent to slave labor camps, so they weren't there for the rescue. But while the the um, Cabana Tuan raid was going on, MacArthur was extremely upset about the stalled advance towards Manila. And he believed that the 37th Infantry, which was on the point, was not acting aggressively enough. And at that, on the 27th of January, the first cavalry who had been fighting for 73 days in Leyte uh, was brought over and landed at Lingayen. They deserved R&R &R after the action that they had had, but MacArthur called in their commander, General Mudge, and he told General Mudge, I want you to go to Manila. And I think his exact words were, go to Manila, bounce off the nips, go around the nips, but go to Manila and rescue the uh, internees at Santo Tomas. Within one day, General Mudge had organized what he called a flying column. This was a composite column that included tanks, vehicles, uh, artillery, um, hospital units, uh, air, ground to air controllers because the Marine Corps was uh, going to provide air cover. And they moved into position on the night of the, the uh, 31st of January, actually passing through the columns of prisoners coming back from Cabana Tuan as they got ready to uh, start their race to Manila. They had four days of rations with them. The, at one minute after midnight on February 1st, they broke through the Japanese lines and through that night, they encountered heavy fighting near Cabanatuan City and Santa Rosa. But by the next day, they had broken through that resistance and they started to race down the central highway, sometimes going 50 miles an hour. And that second day of fighting, uh, they traveled clear down to just north of Manila when they ran out of fuel. Um, I'm going to read you something here about somebody who was on, by someone who was on that column. It's uh, by Bill Dunn, who was a CBS radio war correspondent, one of two correspondents who was with the uh, column. Nowhere else in history of warfare will you find an instance of a military commander sending a force of barely 800 men into a city of more than a million population known to be held by the equivalent of several divisions of infantry. It was impossible, and the Japanese knew it was impossible. That was the premise on which MacArthur founded his entire strategy for the thrust. I should point out here that the commanding general of the Japanese, General Yamashita, had concluded long ago that Manila was not defensible that in the event of invasion, he would evacuate the city. He had 10,000 troops within the city uh, at the time MacArthur was making his advance, uh, and he had ordered them to blow up all strategic facilities and then to leave the city and join the forces to the south. However, there was an admiral, Admiral Iwabashi, who had 16,000 naval troops in the city. Nominally, he was under the command of General Yamashita, but he decided that he was not going to evacuate the city and he was not going to surrender. And he commandeered the 10,000 army troops and set up, started to set up a defense for Manila. So there were essentially 26,000 troops in Manila as this 800-man column came racing down the valley to enter the city. Um, 
That night, the second night, the night of February 2nd, a fuel convoy finally arrived at the uh, bivouac for the, uh, the flying column. And by morning, they were able to fuel up their trucks, jeeps, tanks, and move on out again. By early afternoon, they reached Novalichis, where they faced the last barrier to Manila. And that was a river that was running through a gorge. As they approached the river and the bridge that crossed it, they discovered that the Japanese had put dem uh, demolition charges on the bridge. And when they arrived, the Japanese lit the fuse. If they couldn't get across that bridge, it might take them one or two days to find it their way around for another crossing. A Navy demolitions expert raced out onto the bridge through heavy sniper file, fire, cut the fuse, and threw the demolition charges into the gorge, and the tanks immediately crossed the bridge and created a bridgehead, and the way was now open to Manila. The flying column was made up of um, three, what they call three serials. Each serial had a tank, tank company uh, and other support uh, people, and each had its own mission. At 6.30, the first serial arrived at the, at the city limits of Manila. Uh, their mission was to free the Malacanang Palace. The Mal Malacanang Palace is the equivalent of the White House for the, uh, for the Philippines. So they raced down a main street over to the Malacanang Palace, and uh, the Japanese were so surprised they just got through with practically uh, no resistance whatsoever, and were able to throw up a defense around the, the Malacanang Palace with a uh, group of Filipino guerrillas. The guerrillas helped to suppress uh, sniper fire, which was now coming in fairly strongly, uh, a lot of it coming from the San Miguel Brewery over here. And of course, the troopers had the orders, hey, don't do too much shooting into the brewery. We want to save those, those uh, vats of beer. Um, but anyway, the second serial arrived shortly afterwards, and it was met by a band of guerrillas at the outskirts of Manila, and it was guided through the back way to the front entrance of Santa Tomas. When they arrived at the main gate of Santa Tomas, they discovered that there was an iron arch that went over the gate, and it was too low to allow the tanks to go underneath. So the serial commander uh, dismounted from his jeep along with the guerrilla commander, and they went to evaluate how they could get into Santa Tomas. And while they were there, they uh, encountered a, uh, some resistance from the Japanese guards at the front gate, and both of them were wounded, and the guerrilla was mortally wounded. So while the corpsmen were dragging them off out of the line of fire to, so they could treat them, one of the tanks lined up and broke through the wall right next to the gate and moved into the uh, campus, uh, followed by the other tanks and trucks and jeeps and, uh, and troopers on foot. The uh, troopers immediately were able to free the main building where a large number of the internees uh, were housed. But the Japanese guards, about 72 of them, entered the building uh, adjacent to it, and had, where there were 228 prisoners located, and took them as hostages. There was immediately a huge firefight until the Japanese realized that they were getting the uh, worst of the firefight, so they dispersed themselves among the hostages. The firefight ended, and the next morning, negotiations started with the Japanese as to how they would release the hostages. And it was agreed by the, the end of that day that they would be released 
into a sector of Manila that they chose uh, and were allowed to leave with their weapons, but they would leave their hostages free. So the next morning, the 5th of February, the Japanese marched out between two ranks of uh, troopers and were taken, allowed to go to the sector of Manila that they had chosen and were released. Well, it just turned out, just by happenstance, there was a band of guerrillas operating in that sector. And very shortly, there was a huge firefight, and practically all of the uh, Japanese garrison had been killed. But once the Japanese were gone, the whole camp was now liberated, and the internees had one heck of a celebration uh, in the front, as you might expect. This Santa Tomas was 65 acres enclosed with a wall, and inside that wall were literally hundreds of tanks, uh, military vehicles, artillery. It was the only part of Manila that had been freed, and it was essentially a fortress within an occupied city. During the day, the second day, the 4th of uh, February, the 1st Cavalry sent out foot and tank patrols to find out where the Japanese were. And in the evening of that day, they uh, were moving down a street not too far from Santa Tomas, where there was a uh, tall wall, and they heard a voice. Hey, are you guys Americans? I acknowledge that they were. And the voice said, hey, can you get us out of here? We're POWs they had stumbled onto Bilibid Prison. Bilibid Prison was never an objective to be freed. The Americans did not know that it was being used as a POW camp, which was strange because all of those prisoners from Cabanatuan who had been sent to uh, be slave laborers had passed through Bilibid. It was the staging area to put them on the hell ships. But be that as it may, the patrol was too small to do much about liberating them, and so they just said that they would uh, inform the uh, commanders about the situation. Well, the next evening, a day later, the 37th Infantry entered Manila. Now, they had come across a river using small boats and had built a rickety bridge, so they had no transport with them and uh, a company entered uh, late in the day of the 5th of February. And the, once they entered the city, the company commander sent one of the platoons out to reconnoiter and to find out where the Japanese were. After an hour, the platoon hadn't reported back and the command, company commander was getting very worried. So he sent out a patrol to look for them and the patrol moved down a, the main street until they ran into a heavy machine gun fire. They debated whether they should go back or take a different route. They decided to take a different route and they took one of the side streets and they came upon the entrance to Bilibid Prison. They discovered two guards out front, which they immediately dispatched, and then they moved around the side of the uh, prison and found a shed which they entered and there was a uh, wooden gate going into the prison. They uh, opened the gate and they found the prisoners there and the prisoners at first thought they were Germans. They'd never seen helmets and uniforms that, like this before but they pretty soon calmed down the, uh, the prisoners and uh, brought up the rest of the company and essentially liberated the camp. <coughs> what had happened was that the commander of the garrison uh, had pulled all of his people out except for a few guards on the outside when the Americans he realized the Americans were entering the city uh, and joined the de other defenses for the city. Well, at that time, the Battle of Manila was really beginning to heat up. The Japanese had finally realized the Americans were in the city, 
and uh, started to burn North Manila. Their strategy was to set everything they could on fire to prevent the Americans from moving very rapidly towards the center of the city. One of the fires was burning towards Bilibid Prison, and the 37th Division people had intelligence that said there was an ammunition dump right adjacent to the wall, as, long, as well as a fuel dump. So they had to evacuate the uh, prisoners. Now, in Bilibid, there were 800 POWs who were too sick to send to slave labor, and 500 civilians also in pretty bad shape. And they didn't have transport. So they tried to get these people to walk to uh, further north to get away from where the fires were because of the danger of an explosion wiping out the camp. Uh, again, they ran into the situation. The prisoners didn't want to leave. They wanted to gather up their possessions that they had hoarded for all these years and take those with them. There was one woman who wouldn't leave without her mattress. Um, but eventually they got them going and the first cavalry was able to send ambulances and trucks to help the evacuation. But at this point in time, uh, the Battle of Manila was really going very strongly and the Japanese started to shell Santa Tomas internment camp. Uh, and this is a picture of the first shell hitting the building, resulting in over 100 casualties, uh, 22 people killed, six, 17 of them uh, internees who had just been liberated, uh, plus troopers. But the fighting was now going on really across the river from Santa Tomas. And uh, that was just a mile away. And uh, it was very fierce. And artillery was essentially reducing the city to rubble. In the battle, it's estimated that 100,000 Filipinos, Filipino civilians died. 20,000 of them were caught in the crossfire between the Japanese and the Americans. The other 80,000 were executed. They were taken out and shot or had their head, heads lopped off or bayoneted. Uh, the women uh, and children were raped before being killed. Uh, and it was, it's now called the uh, Manila Massacre. And uh, it is uh, rather a sad, uh, his part of the history of Manila. Manila wound up being the second most destroyed uh, city in, uh, of World War II, next to Warsaw. Uh, this picture was taken, an aerial photo, probably just about between Santa Tomas and Bilibid Prison. But it, it just illustrates how particularly uh, the old city right in here was just absolutely reduced to rubble. And it wasn't until 1975 that it was rebuilt. The, uh, while the fighting was going on, MacArthur realized that he had to free the prisoners at Los Banos. The prisoners at Los Banos had once been in Santa Tomas, but Santa Tomas had become so overcrowded that they built a separate camp, essentially in the jungle, next to the Laguna de Bay. Um, here was Los Banos, and this was a large lake, the Lake Laguna de Bay. The uh, 11th Airborne Division had landed here on January 31st, and their mission had been to essentially move south and uh, south and east and free the lower part of the island. But MacArthur was so anxious to get into Manila that he did one of his typical tricks. He changed their mission halfway through the, uh, before they had even really started. The 11th uh, Airborne then was directed to move north into Manila. And uh, they, met stiff resistance, uh, but by 
The middle of uh, January, we're beginning to move into within two or three miles of Manila. MacArthur ordered them to put together a mission to free the prisoners at Los Banos. There were 2,150 prisoners there. Within two days, they had put together a plan for a four-pronged attack. The attack would be basically around an airdrop by a company of uh, airborne troops uh, supported by the rest of the battalion coming over the lake in Amtrak's and by guerrillas emerging from the uh, jungle to attack the front of the, uh, of the camp and to provide a diversion while the uh, paratroopers were dropping in. Then there was a regiment that would come overland uh, with trucks and other vehicles that would be used to evacuate the prisoners. Two days before the uh, attack was to start, the recon patrol uh, platoon crossed the Laguna de Bay in native canoes and arrived at the Los Banos village where they started to organize the guerrillas. The guerrillas were going to be in the jungle and when they got the signal that uh, the paratroopers were about to drop, they would emerge from the jungle and attack the front gate and pillboxes around the front gate. Well, Murphy was around at that time too. And if anything can go wrong, it will go wrong. So the guerrillas were in the jungle uh, waiting to attack. They were still sort of getting organized. They weren't really ready. And there was a Japanese guard who had gone into the jungle to see if you could shoot something for the pot, for food. And at about 10 minutes to 7, with the drop starting at 7, but at 10 minutes to 7, that guard shot at a possum. The guerrillas heard the shot, they concluded it was the signal to uh, attack, and they came swarming out of the jungle and uh, taking on the Japanese garrison. The Japanese garrison had essentially been at their exercise program. Their guns were in the barracks. They were out in the exercise field doing their morning calisthenics when the attack start, started. And uh, by the time paratroopers had dropped and organized and entered the camp, the battle was all but over. There were just a few guerrillas, a few uh, Japanese left. Most of them had been either killed or had escaped into the jungle. Now the uh, paratroopers had to get the civilians organized to get them evacuated because they were still deep in Japanese territory. And the commander could hear a great deal of shooting and firing from the uh, column that was supposed to transport them out. He realized that they were not going to be able to get into the camp. There was too much resistance from the Japanese. So he changed the plan and decided to evacuate everybody on the Amtraks. Well, the Amtraks wouldn't take everybody, but uh, they would make two trips. So they tr started to load the Amtraks, but the internees didn't want to leave. They wanted to collect their souvenirs. They wanted to collect that little bag of rice that they'd been hoarding for two months, or uh, that book of notes, that notebook that they had, or uh, the tin pan that they ate out of. And so they were all running back into the barracks, and the Japanese were coming closer. So the troopers decided the only thing they could do is they set fire to the barracks. That drove the uh, internees out of the barracks. They got them into the Amtraks, and they took off across the lake. So this was the camp, the shanties, uh, the uh, barracks, which were just bamboo and, uh, and nipa, all very flammable. The uh, internees then started getting loaded onto the Amtraks, and they pulled out of the camp about 10 o'clock in the morning. Now remember that the attack started at 
seven or ten minutes to seven. Uh, they were out of there in three hours, having just uh, essentially wiped out the uh, garrison. The uh, Amtraks went back across the Laguna Dubai, dropped off their load of uh, internees, and then came back and picked up a few more internees who had not been able to get on the Amtraks and the rest of the, uh, the troopers who had to be brought back in. And they left at three, so at three o'clock, essentially, the camp was abandoned. The uh, regiment that had, had uh, been coming overland then broke off their engagement, and it turned out with a division of Japanese. And the, division, the Japanese came racing back into Cabanatuan. And this is the tragedy of that particular raid, is that they killed a 1,000 Filipino civilians who they blamed for helping the Americans. In one case, herding men, women, and children into a wooden church and burning it down. Uh, so uh, that is the tragedy, but aside from that, there were just a few guerrillas were killed. There was no parachutists were killed, and uh, two of the internees were wounded, one of them going back into the uh, uh, barracks to try to recover a book that she had. So it turned out to be, again, an entirely, extremely successful raid. And in fact, uh, Colin Powell had this to say, I doubt that any airborne and guerrilla unit in the world will ever be able to rival the Los Banos raid. It is a textbook operation for all ages and armies. And the raid is still studied uh, in command school for the Army. What these uh, raids really tell us is that, first of all, the planning was extremely short. In no case was there more than six days available to plan an operation. That was for Cabana Tuan. Uh, the uh, flying column was two days. The uh, Los Banos raid was four days. But the planning was done by the people who were going on the raid. It wasn't done by staff who would then tell them what they should do. Uh, and the plans were extremely flexible. And every time that Murphy uh, showed his ugly head, they were able to move, or move and change the plan to succeed. The prisoners were not forewarned. Uh, and they couldn't be forewarned, because if they were forewarned, the Japanese would have known. But they were not prepared to leave, and it took a lot of effort on the part of the troops who made the attack to get them moving, to get them out of there in, in the three camps where they were uh, in jeopardy from Japanese counterattacks. The US casualties were extremely low compared to the Japanese, and without the help and assistance of the Filipino guerrillas, who actually committed more men than the Americans did, these raids would not have been successful. The Filipinos do not get credit for the, what they uh, did, but they were the main uh, force behind those liberations that made them possible. Last of all, all three raids resulted from total surprise. The Japanese had no inkling that the Americans come that deep into their territory to uh, release the prisoners, and so they were not, they were not prepared to defend themselves. And uh, that is probably the one thing that made them so successful. I don't think that we have ever seen since that time any American action that uh, surpasses what happened with these three raids. Certainly we've seen a lot of disasters that did not work. The aftermath of this is that the prisoners have a lifelong gratitude for the troopers who came in and rescued them. Uh, we have several in our organization. Uh, they meet with us uh, at regular meetings. They're totally overwhelmed with the love that comes out and I know that uh, at one of our reunions, 
One of the um, cavalrymen who came into Santa Tomas was talking about what he saw when he came into the camp. And, you know, a big tough guy, and, and he was crying by the time he finished describing what he had seen there. And uh, he was sort of overwhelmed with uh, the affection of the people in that audience. The Los Banos survivors set up a trust fund, an educational trust fund, and they provide uh, funds to the uh, natives in, Los Can in the Filipinos in uh, lo the village of Los Banos for uh, educational scholarships. It's sort of their payback for what happened to those poor people who were massacred by the Japanese. And again, I think as I said before, there was, I don't think there has ever been a rescue of this magnitude in such a short period of time in the history of the military since that time. All right, uh, that's my prepared speech. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to address them. We do have another Santa Tomas survivor right here. Would you like to stand up? Yes, I was five when uh, we were liberated and, <clears throat> excuse me, have uh, really wiped a lot of that out of my memory. Um, so I do remember at the end of the war being more afraid of the Americans <clears throat> than I ever was of the Japanese because I had learned to live with them. And, um, you know, just all the noise, they were strange. Um, uh, the, the Japanese had an idea that something was going on. And I have a, uh, a doll that a Japanese guard gave me uh, because he felt that he was not going to get back to give this doll to his daughter. And uh, so I have that to this day. And I'm sure my mother was one of those that ran back and got things, the souvenir. Um, uh, we, I had a drawing, my brother and I each, uh, done by one of the internees as a birthday gift, uh, just a pen colored pencil drawing, a uh, portrait of each of us, a little cup tin cup that one of the gar internees had made that uh, with my name on it had soldered it uh, and, and soldered a little handle on it. I keep buttons and things in it <laughs> to this day. Uh, but at any rate, uh, it's, it's a part of my life that I've tried to, you know, for whatever reason, um, erase or not go back to, but after your lecture today, it's like, okay, I really want to know a lot more about what, what happened. So, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> he asked that I mentioned uh, whether I was in the army or a uh, civilian. I was a civilian. My family lived in China, and my father decided the Japanese were going to attack American interests, and he wanted to get us out of Japanese-occupied China. So he put us on a ship to Hong Kong where we were going to try to get another ship to either New Zealand or Australia. Well, we sailed into Hong Kong Harbor on, uh, while Pearl Harbor was being bombed, and the ship was turned around and sent to the nearest friendly port, which was Manila, where it was eventually sunk and we were stranded. So that's how we wound up. I was uh, six years old at that time, uh, nine years old when we were liberated. Well, in 1947, I, I was in the Marine Corps going to China, and I stopped by uh, in the Philippines. Uh, we anchored, and I saw Santa Tomas, and it's just a memory I'll never forget to see all of those windows broken there. And then uh, Manila Bay, uh, to see all those uh, ships uh, it was something I'll, I'll never forget. It was just, a, you know, terrible. As he says, Manila was very badly destroyed. Uh, Santa Tomas had three days of shelling uh, that did considerable damage to the buildings. But you can go back today and you wouldn't even know 
that there had been a battle there. Our um, organization for civilian POWs, we have about 175 people now spread out all over the United States. It is called the Bay Area Civilian XPOWs, and we're a chapter of the American XPOWs, which is a congressionally chartered organization for uh, ex-prisoners of war. The, uh, I've got a, my card is here, which gives the uh, email address if anyone wants to find out more about it. Uh, the other place to go would be www.basepow.net. Uh, and we have a website there that gives more information. I was uh, very fortunate to be able to go back to Santa Tomas for the celebration of the 60th anniversary of liberation. And it was a very big affair with all kinds of politicians and uh, the American embassy people and uh, with a huge banquet out in the uh, plaza in front. And I was seated at a table with an elderly gentleman and we started to talk and it turned out that he was a Filipino guerrilla. He was the first Filipino guerrilla to enter Santa Tomas on liberation night. He had been with Captain Kalaiko, who was killed at the gate, uh, and he had stayed with the captain while he was in surgery and while he died. He also uh, provided a lot of intelligence about where the Japanese were to the American forces. During the evening, I asked him how he felt about what, uh, today, about what had happened. And I think he said this very well, because it, I think we all feel the same way. And that is that today, uh, what happened was a long time ago, and, and today we must learn to forgive but we must never forget what happened here because it is part of our history and we don't want to let that disappear. Thank you. Thank you for watching Peninsula Senior Lecture Series. I'm Betty Wheaton. See you next time.